Again, good morning and thanks for being here and being a part of the, the Myth Busters uh, show that says, again, you can sing country and still praise Jesus. So that myth has been broken and you have been a part of that. So thank you for doing that. If some of you are grumpy today, I can understand. This is your last week to do your taxes. And so if you haven't, I can understand a little bit of grumpiness out there. So mine's done and in. soon enough for you. But again, thanks for joining us as we continue to look into this uh, book that Paul wrote to his friends and to the church that he started uh, in Corinth. You know, last week we did talk about, uh, uh, about sacrificing meat and should you eat the meat that was sacrificed to idols. And, and Paul, Paul says that since those idols were false, yeah, it's maybe no big deal. Because if it's false, you get it, the meat, it's just meat. So you might as well be a good steward and eat that meat. Uh, but then he doesn't stop there. He challenges them that even though it may be okay to eat the meat, there's a bigger value, an overarching value that he talks about. He talks about it in the sense of, but if it causes your weaker brother to stumble or to be destroyed then maybe you should put a pause on that. Because it really isn't about you. And so today we continue in that same book. It's going to be chapter 10. And it, and it talks about uh, that same theme, you know, of not eating the meat uh, because it may cause our brother to stumble. But we're talking, and still we're talking in the sense of, of some other freedoms and some other actions that we may have that may cause harm to ourselves or, or, or to the body. And Paul is, again, he's talking here to the stronger, more mature believer. And he is addressing uh, the topic of, of idols, of worshiping idols. And, and I think at times that, that we may think, well, this is a brush off passage. You know, idols. I'm in a in America. I don't have any idols. You know, I don't worship certain statues. I don't have certain certain things in my life that I I bow down to or that I pray to or that I receive some mystical power from. And again, because, you know, I just don't do that. Because I'm an American, and those statues, those idols, those symbols are far from me in, in, in my own walk. But I think it's interesting that it's precisely because we are an American that we probably ought to look at some of our own American idols. Some of the, our own habits, some of our own desires, some of our own passions. First Corinthians. So let's pray. Thank you again, God, for being here. Thank you, God, for, uh, for the people here, for the people on a, on a little bit chillier of a day. It may have been easier to stay home, but yet they are here. For those who may still be questioning who you are and what this whole thing is about, thank you. Thank you that they've taken the risk and they have entered this place. And so I simply pray and, uh, for those that, that the thoughts that are going on in, in their minds and, and even in their hearts, and maybe it's a brokenness or it's a confusion or it's a doubt. I pray, God, that they will... Uh, not leave them at the door, but they have brought them all in here to this place. And I pray that the, the words of my mouth will be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now the passage we're looking at again is in is 1 Corinthians and it's chapter 10. It's on page 798 and those chair Bibles that you are welcome to take with you. 
if you don't have one. But, but let me just share here that Paul is taking the church back to the scriptures that they had, back to the, the Old Testament. And he's reminding them of some pretty miraculous things that occurred, of them passing the people, of how God people didn't grow up to see and how uh, God had provided food for them and just dropped it literally right out of heaven for them to eat. How God commands Moses to change the rock into, into some water. Paul is reminding the people of a familiar story. Because it's a story that had been told over and over and over. And it's a part of God's story that we need to continue to tell over and over and over. And yet it's more than once that it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget how God has provided, how God has led his people. Because we're human. And for most of us, we just focus on the here and now and what I'm feeling, how I'm responding to so-and-so, how I don't like when I have to pay in taxes. And I, I'm just responding to the current realities. And so as Paul reminded his church, his early church, so then I remind you and remind myself of God's faithfulness as we look into this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, we're not going to, uh, uh, the very end of this passage talks a little bit about the Lord's Supper and communion. And I'll mention that briefly today, but in three weeks, the entire service in the passage will be focusing on the Lord's Supper. But let's take a look at, at the first few passages in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud as they, had, as they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Again, folks, this just wasn't some random uh, thought that Paul was happening, what that Paul was ha having. Paul was taking them back to the scripture that they knew they, they wouldn't have had the New Testament like we just read from. But he's taken it back to, to remind them of God's story. And again, to remind him that, you know, uh, we forget easily. And this just isn't a story for the sake of a story. But it points back to Jesus. And it's a reminder that all points us back to Jesus not just the New Testament. And it's also interesting, I think, that uh, verse 5, verse 5 tells us that, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. That, you know, God is not only doing the work to save the people and to provide for them, but he does that for today. And yet, there's a glitch in there. And while they might, not, they might not have an American idol, they're having some issues that Paul is attempting to deal with here. You know, Paul makes references, again, to the Old Testament. And I think some of us had probably been sold a bill of goods when it comes to not just the Old Testament, but maybe even the New Testament. In the sense that the Old Testament or Scripture is more than a, uh, than a leadership workshop. The Old Testament is more than me just saying, well, look at Moses. And despite uh, his human weaknesses, he leaned into those human weaknesses and God used him and God made him successful. 
God will use us and make us successful. Now, Scripture is much more than just a modern-day leadership lesson. And if we just look at Scripture as what's in it for me, and how can I just lead a better life, then we've sold Scripture short. It's a reminder. It is a reminder of God's story. It's a reminder of God's story, how he led his people, how he loved his people, how he provided for his people time and time again, and yet at times how his people just snubbed their nose. How they continued to question what was going on. And so again, I just think in our culture and, and, and some of the books and some of the teachings, we need to be careful that we don't shortchange the scripture, that we don't shortchange God's word and make it just what lessons can I learn, but what can I discover? What can I be reminded about in God's story? And so, again, what I have found interesting as I, I read this, because, again, I just thought, okay, you know, like at my introduction, you know, idols, do we have any idols? Most of us probably don't. Uh, uh, so how am I, what is going to, to make a difference in our people's lives? But again, Paul started off with, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters. So again, what does Paul do? He takes them back to the scripture. And so I think for, for all of us, no matter what situation we're in, we need to go back to the scriptures. And then, but what also was interesting, you know, they did all these things. All these people, you know, they ate, they drank, they, they were with other believers. And yet verse 5 is very powerful because it says again, and it, it says, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So folks, they had, they had been through it all. They were doing the right things, and yet God wasn't pleased. So I'm thinking, again, for us, how often do we think, hey, at least I'm doing the right things. Maybe you're showing up at church. Maybe you're showing up at church more than just Easter and uh, Christmas, but a few more times. You know, maybe you're dropping some money into the plate. Maybe you helped redo the new nursery. You know, maybe you're, you're serving in the right places. But God isn't, about, isn't just a God about what you're doing and doing the right things. God wants to make sure your hearts have been changed. He wants to make sure my heart, your heart, our hearts have been changed by his word and by his spirit. And so I found that very interesting that Paul lays it out. The earth, folks, just isn't what you need to believe. Paul is saying it's more than traditions. Now, if I use the word idols, I think many of us just disconnect that from us. But if I sort of throw in that word traditions, I think it strikes home with a whole bunch of us. Because we have some traditions that we probably worship. We have some symbols that we probably worship. And we know God isn't in the symbols. God isn't in the traditions themselves. But if they don't point us to the living God, then they're just stuff to do and things to look at. So think, th think about that as we process this together. That, you know, what are you holding on to so tight, so afraid to let go of, so adamant that it has to be a certain way, that it's really more of a tradition than it is anything else. 
And again, some tradi traditions are wonderful. Traditions help keep our families in line. Traditions help keep our church in line. But just not in line, but traditions help us to remember. But let's not start to worship our traditions. Okay, let's go to, uh, to verses, verses 6 through 10. Let me read, read those for us. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 20,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did. And, they, and, and, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did. And were killed by the destroying angel. Paul, again, is encouraging his people, his friends, his church, not to get hooked into some, into some idolatry stuff. He goes to the scripture and he again tells the story so they're not ignorant, so they can remember, oh, that's right. And in verse 7, he is referring back to Exodus 32. You can make some notes of that if you want to. Exodus, Exodus, 30, Exodus 32. Most of us may know that story. You know, Moses was you know, talking to God. He was getting the Ten Commandments and the people were getting a little worse. And so they convince the guy in charge. Uh, they convince him of their restlessness that they got to do something. And so he says, yep, go ahead. Let's bring in your gold. They make this calf. Paul reminds them of the idolatry in that. And now again, we may not have a, a golden calf that we worship. We probably have some other areas of worship. Again, let's just be careful about worshiping other things, and it's maybe our own schedules. Again, you've, you've heard us say before, busyness is not next to godliness. And I wonder if that's what the people were even thinking when Moses was up getting the Ten Commandments. We've got to do something here. So let's, let's just make something happen. And the lust struggle with the, with the uh, practice of just slowing us down. And allowing God to move and to speak into our own lives. So again, I say what Paul shares. I don't want us to be ignorant of what occurred. Again, and in, in, uh, let's go to verse 9. And again, Paul is referring back to number 1 again. As some of them were testing God and getting a little presumptuous in what they were doing. And many of them were killed. Paul is reminding the church that their attitudes and their actions make a difference. And that our own selfishness that may take God off of his path is not ideal. We need to be careful not to assume anything. We need to be careful not to live like I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, because Jesus loves me, this I know. Because in this story, God wipes out more people. Again, Paul is reminding the people that our faith needs to take our focus toward God and toward others, not necessarily ourselves. Uh, also, uh, you know, I, I, and let's go back just to verse 8 a little bit, one that I don't want to skip over. Uh, 
We should not eat and drink and indulge in rivalry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 were killed. Again, the story of that uh, is also uh, in that. In verse 25. God warned them about some, uh, some, some sexual immorality. And yet, in the middle of a worship service, some cocky guy parades this woman in front of everybody, takes her into the tent, and you can just use your imagination. They probably weren't doing a Bible study in that tent. And somebody who gets angry gets up, goes into the tent, and, and drives the sword between both of them. Wipes them out. Again, they made a mockery. God had some commands. Some God had, had told them specifically, and they continued to ignore. And God wiped out 20, over 20,000 people. I mean, that's startling to me. I mean, we have a mass shooter kills 11 people or 20 people, not to minimize that. And the whole nation is in an uproar. And I've read this over and over. It just reminds me that I think while we have a friend in Jesus, and while he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own, that it is very easy to mock God and to forget that he is the creator of heaven and earth and of me. And while I believe with my whole heart that he walks with me and he me, how that I am his own, that it is very easy to do and take for granted the magic God who created us. The seriousness of the God who, who wrote this scripture so that we don't make some stupid mistakes. Who wrote the scripture that reminds us of his love and his provision for us in even the most horrible situations. Let's go then to first verse 11 here, folks. Things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us of whom the accumulation of all the ages have come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Paul again, um, Paul again is warning against arrogance, people. And I just think at times it's easy to be a soft and to be for most people. Again, in our cultures, who I'm speaking to, you know, we, uh, we have certain markers of success. Again, there's, they're simple. It's, you know, what we own, maybe where we work, if we own the company. If we're, sing if we're married, I mean, that, that success is, is finally finding a spouse. Or maybe how that... 1K is growing and growing, and, and we wrap our success around those items. But Paul is just warning us the higher, there's a famous classic singer that has a, a line in one of his songs, the higher the top, the longer the drop. And I think this is what Paul is reminding us. That don't let the success and the and and the and power lure us to worshiping those items, those personal characteristics, versus worshiping the God who created us. And when I look at the idea of idols from that perspective, there is no doubt we probably have more than one American idol in this room. Again, in, in, in verse 13, Paul changes his tone a little bit. And he, he goes to wrong, you know, be careful. Yeah, you may have it all, but be careful. And he says this, no testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your own strength. 
but with the testing he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Again, this is, you know, Paul takes on that pastoral, okay, now I was part of the year, but let me just uh, warm up a little bit. Let me just talk a little bit maybe more to the, to the person on the other side of the coin. And yet I think for each of us, we are both, we are both sides of that coin in one person. On one hand, we, we are very, and it's okay to be, uh, have a sh- strong self-esteem. It's okay to be successful. It's okay to have together whatever that all together may mean for you. And yet on the other side of the coin, and this is where Paul shifts, is the weaker person. Is the one, and, and I've met them, that have it all, but still say we're missing it. Something isn't right. We have it all, but we still have relationships with nobody. In our American culture, having it all financially creates a chasm between those who don't have. At least in this conversation I was having. And so this couple felt extremely lonely. And so I think Paul is talking to to all of us. To to us who on one side of the coin uh, we probably struggle with some idols of some kind and on the other side of the coin we're broken and be reminded what Paul says here in verse 13. That God is faithful. And we just forget it, folks. We forget it because we're, we are uh, focused on, on accomplishing what we need to. And so if a relationship is shut in front of you, if a business opportunity slams, if you get pink slipped, we just get so engrossed into the moment is faithful. And so when it comes to this area of of an idol, God is faithful. Again, he says, no testing has overtaken you that is not common to people. So folks, let's, let's don't believe the lie that we can't trust God with everything. Why? Because, you know, God is faithful. So whether you have it all, or you're struggling with, Lord, I have it all, but how do I not worship that? Paul reminds them that you're not alone in that. So don't believe the lie that it's all about you. Don't believe the lie that you're almighty high in whatever you're doing, whatever you have, whatever your idol may be. Paul is saying you're not the only one who's in there. Don't believe the lie. You know, don't believe the lie that, you know, nobody understands me. Don't believe the lie that nobody cares about me. Just don't believe the lie. And Paul again tells us that God is faithful. You know, don't believe the lie that you're the only one who may have some body images. Don't believe the lie that you're the only one whose business, is, whose business has failed. Don't believe the lie you're the only one that paid way too much in your taxes. Don't believe the lie that uh, nobody wants to connect with you because of A, B, or C. Paul says, remember, God is faithful, and you're not alone in your situation. But will the test, will the test also provide the way out so that you may endure? And as I read through this over and over, that's what came to, to my heart over and over. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that 
you may endure. And so whether you are struggling with the, with the American idol of, of, of self-worth, that you have it all and you think you, you're, your stuff don't stink, or maybe thinking, I've screwed up. How in the world can this God of creation welcome me into his arms? I think we both need to remember that God is faithful. But again, I think it's easier said than done. But the testing, he will also provide the way out that we may be endured. So we may endure. So let me just give you uh, four tips on how God, I think God provides that way out for you. I think we need to remember one of the ways out is it's what Paul is talking about. He said, let's go back to the scripture and we need to remember the basic of what we just celebrated two weeks ago. The reality that we continue to be peop uh, Easter people. And we need to remember that one of the ways out is, of course, the cross. Now, not the image of a cross, because the, the image of a cross is just that. It's just an image. It's a symbol. But what happened on the cross? Again, that the God of humanity died and rose again. That is a way out for us. So as we think about the mess I'm in or the feelings I have or the struggles I have with, with success and with idolatry and everything else, we need to remember the cross because we're all the same at the cross. Jesus rose for every one of us. No matter what we look like, no matter what our dreams are, no matter what broken dreams, we remember the cross. Then we need to, another way to, is to remember the word. Again, it's not just a little decoration. It's not just a symbol that, I love Jesus, so here's his Bible. No, he has given us his word to remind us of his, his story, of his redemptive powers for the people that he loved and cared for. He's given us his word to remind us, yes, he leads us through and he provides for us every day. temptation, you look at, the, you remember the cross, you look into his word, and he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're not alone. We are absolutely not alone. While you may feel alone in, in your apartment, in your townhouse, in your home, in your school, we're not alone. That's a myth. We already had one myth about uh, country music. Here's another myth. We are not alone. No matter how much you feel alone, we are not alone. God's spirit is with us. He's given us that gift. He's given us that gift to, to take me off the pedestal of myself. It's a spirit can help me do that. And he's given us the gift that if I'm feeling just I'm a piece of whatever, his spirit raises me up and says, you more than just junk. It. The word reminds us of it, and his Holy Spirit is with us through it. And finally, one way out of it, one way, the final way to remember and to, to work ourselves out of temptation is in community. And there's just no way to teach this without that reality. And yet the tension is, again, the people of Israel, they were, you know, taken through the sea. God provided for them. They still blew it. So community isn't our salvation. It is one of the blessings and the methods that God gives us to, to keep us in line, to keep me human, to keep me in perspective. Because when I love somebody and trust somebody, they're the ones that can say, hey, what about this? Or what about that? Or, you know, don't take it too personal. Or when I talk to my buddies about my work, well, do you have to do this? You know, is, are you doing somebody else's job? And, and we all know this. But the people I know and love, people I'm in authentic community, not just people who are uh, positive thinkers. I'm going to go to the point and say, people who have a commitment to the living God, those are the people that can help us. 
that can help us resist temptation. So we have the cross. We have the word that is with us. We have the spirit that indwells us. And we have the community around us that will help us fight off the temptations of whatever our idols may be. And again, we have them, folks. Let us not pretend we don't. I like what Tim Keller says in his book on counterfeit gods. He says this, what is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. So I think our list probably just grew a few. A counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. An idol has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy, your emotion and financial resources on it without a second thought. So what do you wake up or go to bed thinking and dreaming about? Could that potentially be an idol? family and children, or career and making money, or achievement and critical acclaim, or saving face and social standing. It can be a romantic relationship, peer approval, competence, and skill, secure and comfortable circumstances, your beauty or your brains, a great political or social cause, your morality and virtue, or even success in Christian ministry. And so as I share this, this isn't just a message for you, but as your leaders, Christian leaders as well, we struggle through this. We ask some hard questions, you know, what is success and, and what isn't success? Very, very scary. What we know is to fix somebody else's life. We may call it codependency, but is it really idolatry? When your meaning in life is to fix somebody else's life, maybe your kids, your spouse, somebody you work with, if that consumes us, have they become somebody that we like. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your hearts of hearts. If I have that, then I feel my life has meaning. If I have that, I feel my life is meaning. Then I'll know I'll have value. And then I will feel significant and secure. And so while most of us don't have a totem pole or most of us don't have a particular statue that we feel we receive energy and power from, I think most of us probably do have an American idol of some sort that we need to fight temptation and remember the cross, his word, the spirit, in our community to help us break that. Not just so that I'll be established, but for the sake of the gospel and building relationships and pointing people to Jesus. And all God's people said, hey, the band's going to come back up and they're going to lead us in a time of worship, a time of responsive worship. The ushers are going to come and receive your offerings, receive your gifts, because for many of us, the almighty dollar is our so giving.
by giving back to God, it is a tangible reminder that, you know what, it isn't mine to begin with, God. So here, I trust you with what's left. If you're our guest, don't feel obligated to give. But if God's Spirit is nudging you, that's the Spirit, not your spouse, then feel free to participate. And maybe God is indeed telling, telling you to let's, let's together. Let's celebrate that together as a reminder of the things uh, he has done for us. Maybe you need to light a candle as a way to respond to, again, remind yourself that the light of Jesus needs to enter into a dark place. Maybe it needs to enter into one of your idols that you need to take and give back. And of course, you're welcome to stand or sit, worship, journal, and think through your own life to see how you might be responding.